on the 2nd of November in 2015, the 1916 play by the Irish writer Eva Gore Booth, The Death of Finnevar, was performed as a staged reading at Cork City Jail. Now, Cork City Jail is where Constance Markievicz, sister of the playwright, spent time uh, in prison during the Civil War. We missed the uh, opportunity to perform the play closer to the date of its actual publication. The actual temporal setting was as evocative as the physical setting because we were able to put it on on All Souls Day, and the play is actually set on Samhain. So we were in that mystical time when the division between this world and the next is at its thinnest, which is important to the play. The piece was performed by a combination of professional actors and students from the Drama and Theatre Studies Department here in UCC under the direction of Dr. Marie Kelly. We also had some alumni students in the performance and it was directed by Julie Kelleher, who is the artistic director at The Everyman. The performance was made possible by the Irish Research Council from a fund for commemorative activities. Now, the play The Death of Finnevar was in fact a commemorative publication that appeared in May 1916, just a few weeks after the Rising. And it was decorated for this particular publication with drawings, and decoration is the word that Markovich used. Markovich herself did the illustrations while in jail. As we know, she was sentenced to death for her part in the Rising. She claimed to have done these beautiful black and white drawings using quills that she fashioned out of rook's feathers that she found in the prison yard. The play is dedicated to the Martyrs of the Rising, uh, there's a, a poem that prefaces the play in which Gorbuth refers to those uh, participants in the Rising as uh, poets, utopians, bravest of the brave, dreamers turned fighters, but to find a grave. Now, that word utopia associated with uh, Eva Gorbuth recurs in 1927 in a better known text by Yeats, the poem In Memory of Eva Gorbuth and Khan Markovich. And the poem opens. Uh, Light of evening, Lissadell, great windows open to the south, two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle, the gazelle being Eva Gorbuth, for whom apparently Yeats nurtured a little bit of uh, infatuation. He never acted on it, however. The poem goes on to regret the grown beautiful girl's engagement with various political activities, including what he refers to in connection with Eva Gorbuth, vague utopia, presumably the dream of the 1916 rebels. Now, the sisters met Yeats while they were still young women in Elisadel, and Yeats, to his great credit, recognized Gorbuth's considerable literary powers, and he was influential in helping her get started in her very successful literary career. She published nine well-received volumes of poetry. Her poetry and prose appeared in magazines, journals, newspapers, all around the English-speaking world. Uh, she was extremely well-known, though we have forgotten her, a very popular poet. Uh, she also published seven plays that would sometimes be published uh, alongside poems. However, her success in getting the plays actually onto the stage was not as great as her publication record. Uh, in fact, there was one rather unfortunate back and forth between herself and the National Theater about staging Unseen Kings, which they decided to pass on in the end. Nearly all of Gorbut's plays take Irish myth and legend as their source material. And she was very conscious of growing up in a kind of heroic landscape there in and around Sligo. She was particularly taken with the figure of Maeve, and who was supposedly buried in Achnaray, not too far from Lissadell House. In fact, Gorbuth used Maeve more than once as subject of her writing. Um, and you will notice in the performance that Nachnaray is mentioned many times. Other physical uh, landmarks in and around Sligo, such as Ross's Point, are also identified. Clearly, the, the play is set very concretely in that uh, Sligo landscape. The Death of Finnevar is taken from a longer play about Maeve called The Triumph of Maeve, which was originally published in 1905. In that longer play, we find out more about the kind of the gender dynamics of the politics of the court. We find out that Fergus is in fact plotting against Maeve, and even uh, the Harper Nera, who appears with spring flowers in his hair at the opening of the play, uh, spring flowers that have come from Tirnanog, where he has spent a year. His descriptions of that land of the she appear to be maybe designed in order to tempt Maeve into thinking about conquering that realm. Certainly Maeve's responses to what Nera describes about the wonders of Tirnanog make her think that this is a much more wondrous land than any she has 
uh, conquered or annexed previously. And so she does, in fact, make a siege on the land of the Shi. Of course, she fails. She falls into an enchanted sleep, having drunk from a stream at the entrance to Tirnanog. And she is visited in her dream by the spirit of Deirdre, a very important figure to Maeve. Maeve uh, evokes Deirdre many times in the play. Deirdre uh, lets Maeve know that force is not the way into Tirnanog, and it's not long after that that the death of Finnevar begins. And it begins, as you will notice, with a woman speaking, the Druidess, who is prophesying the death of Finnevar, Finnevar being the much-beloved 16-year-old daughter of Maeve. Now, the love between daughter and mother is very beautifully portrayed in the play, uh, and it's maybe seen as the weak spot or the soft spot in the otherwise very martial, uh, uh, strong-willed uh, Maeve, who is in perfect control of all of her warriors and courtiers, except when it comes to her daughter. And this is typical of Gorbuth's plays, which tend to feature relationships between women uh, and, and also strong women. And you can see how using myth and legend can really lend itself to the representation of, of, of emotionally and physically powerful warrior queens and goddesses. In addition to the, the poems and dedications that preface the play, there is a three-page prose piece about the way in which Eva Gore Booth has taken liberties, and that is her own phrase, taken liberties with these myths. Now she's anticipating what she knows is the criticism she's in for, for deploying this kind of national mythic iconography in a way very different from the ways in which her male contemporaries were, uh, were using it. Uh, Maeve's grief at the death of Finnevar is very touching, very effective. It's one of the really most powerful uh, uh, passages in the performance. It's especially moving if we realize that while Eva Gore Booth was preparing this commemorative edition of the play, her sister was under sentence of death. The sisters were very close. They had a, an exceptionally close relationship. Uh, Constance did not long survive the death of her younger sister, Eva. While Constance was in prison, wherever she was in prison, uh, they would set aside, the sisters would set aside an hour every day, usually kind of around uh, you know, dawn or dusk, one of those transitional times of day, in which they would think of nothing but each other in the hopes of uh, establishing a telepathic uh, connection. So when Maeve is begging the corpse of her, her daughter, Finnevar, to open the gates of Tirnanog to her, it's impossible not to think of Eva Gore Booth at the same time as she's preparing this manuscript, wildly grieving for the impending death of her, of her sister. Um, she would say things at the time such as, I wish she were killed in the heat and glory of battle rather than so coldly executed. It was a very painful time for her. However, even in this depth of despair, Gore Booth was able to entertain some kind of hope. And I think in many ways, this publication is an expression of that. Gore Booth was somebody who was interested in theosophy. Uh, she was particularly invested in the idea of reincarnation. And she saw it uh, as important, uh, not only spiritually, but uh, philosophically and even aesthetically. This idea of eternal return uh, and, and the cyclical structure of time, it's something that we see in Yeats also interested in uh, theosophy and his widening gyres is a kind of a, rep a representation, a poetic representation of that uh, spinning way that time works in this cosmic uh, uh, context. And in fact, that design of the helixing spinning shape is something that we see throughout the text uh, in Markievicz's design. She incorporates many theosophical symbols such as the caduceus, the, um, the Ouroboros, even primroses were important in various hermetic uh, groups at the time including theosophy. And so we have then the sisters possibly using this text as a way of expressing their hope that they, that they never be parted. So May's feeling uh, at the end of the play that uh, she will now be able to enter Tirnanog. It's not that she's going to commit suicide, but, but that she has kind of come to peace uh, with her life and she is now ready for this kind of reunion with her daughter. Clearly reflects the sisters' feelings that even in the depth of despair, they would be re reunited. So not only the plot, but the illustrations of the play really gesture towards this idea of transcendence of pain and of war. Often, really almost all the time, this play is read as anti-war. And I think that that's an overly simplistic way of looking at the text, especially if you read uh, other writings of Gorbuds about both the rising and in general, this idea that peace is only possible through pain. She shared 
her sister's belief in the rising. Utopia is achievable, but it requires sacrifice, including war, uh, suffering. So even at their darkest moment, I think both sisters believed they would see each other again somewhere sometime. <laughs>